I'm gonna say something controversial. Eric Clapton was worse than Tom Sandoval in the 70s and 80s. When I first started this video, Scandoval was in full force, but people have moved on since then because you know what? Scandal moves at the speed of light to, I don't know, Colleen Ballinger's ukulele apology. <laughs> that was a choice. But the benefit of this story is that we have time and perspective. Do you not see how necessary a world of pains and troubles is to school and intelligence and make it a soul? And nothing epitomizes this more than the story of Eric Clapton, George Harrison, Patty Boyd, and her sisters. And I was shocked at how similar it was to Scandoval. But let's look at the short that I started with. So they're having a great time gabbing and gossiping about mutual acquaintances. Eric Clapton. Oh, sorry. I've got a sniffle. <laughs> Long rumored to be the cheating jerk that inspired the song My Favorite Mistake, he was married to Patty Boyd, sister of Mick Fleetwood's wife, Jenny Boyd. That's the wife Mick Fleetwood was married to when he had an affair with Stevie. Jenny Boyd at the time sought refuge with her sister Patty Boyd, who Eric Clapton had already stolen from his good friend George Harrison famously inspiring the song Layla. Well, Jenny was staying with her sister Patty when Eric Clapton crawled into bed with her while her own sister was asleep in the same house. Yeah. <laughs> and the truth is that the story is even more complicated and more scandalous than that. This story is a lot worse. But the benefit of this story is that we have time and perspective, like I said. We know where this story leads. No one dies, at least of these events. All the people in this story end up with a relatively happy existence. But along the way, this story was crazy, and this kind of turmoil makes great art. Although, Tom Sandoval, Eric Clapton, I don't know, which art do you prefer? <laughs> But we're gonna tell the story through the songs that the events inspired. Songs like Layla, Beautiful Tonight, and Something by the Beatles. So let's get started. Let's do a dating family tree. Let me introduce you to the three Boyd sisters, who were all models and it girls. And Eric Clapton either hooked up with or tried to hook up with all three sisters. He was busy in that family. We discussed Patty and we discussed Jenny, but there was also Paula. Patty was married to George Harrison and Eric Clapton in a really weird way, but more on that later. And Paula, she also used to be with Eric Clapton. More on that later. And Jenny was married to Mick Fleetwood. All three were beautiful models, actresses, it girls, and rock muses. They would be like the Car Jenners, Although maybe not quite as successful since they didn't have a momager like Kris Jenner. They were wild childs, but they were also more homebodies than your average groupie. And they all inspired many classic songs that we'll get into. And Eric Clapton and George Harrison were indeed friends. And if Eric Clapton is Tom Sandoval, and a little Raquel too. But in this story, George Harrison is James Kennedy. Can't even believe I'm making these comparisons. For this story, it's true from a story standpoint. Something in the way she moves that attracts me like no other lover. Something is a song written by George Harrison. It was a love song inspired by the early days of marriage between Patty and George Harrison. Frank Sinatra called something the most romantic song ever written. And Patty and George Harrison met on the set of A Hard Day's Night, the Beatles film, and they were both just shy Pisces. He was incredibly good looking, very, very attractive, but also he seemed quite shy. And me being rather shy, I sort of felt an affinity with him. Uh, and they clicked. How did he ask you to marry him? One day he said, I think we should really get married. I'm going to go and speak to Brian. And then came back out and gave me a big kiss and said, Brian says we can get married in January. On the ABC. <laughs> Patty would settle into cozy domesticity, while George would go on to make the greatest music of his career with the Beatles including a song George told Patty he'd written for her. And 
you know, he was quite shy and he didn't really tell me straight away that he'd written it for me. He waited till he got back from the studio and they put it down on a cassette. Do you remember those little cassettes? Yes. And so he played it and said that he'd written it for me and I was just completely blown away. And I think what's happened with time, it has become more iconic. Because when I first heard it, you know, it's, it's a beautiful song. Yeah. But then the more you hear it, the more it just gets to you because it's so beautiful. But like James Kennedy, George Harrison made a lot of mistakes when he was young. For instance, in Patty's book, she talks about how they didn't have a perfect marriage. It all started in an ashram in Rishikesh, India. It was a spiritually enlightened time for the two. And George Harrison was inspired by the teachings of the Maharishi, who had what was basically a harem of women. <laughs> And apparently George wanted that too. And one day George decides to tell Patty this and she's like, uh, no, I don't think so. But George had made up his mind and he began to cheat on her when they got back to the UK. And although this is bad, at least he was honest with her, which is more than I can say for Eric Clapton. And at least he didn't try it with her sister. And I always say everyone messes up, that's an inevitability. But I do like that George Harrison was always on a quest to be a better person. And Patty was a big influence on his spiritual life. She was the one who introduced him to transcendental meditation, for instance. And that's what led them to the ashram. So she was responsible for starting his growth spiritually, but unfortunately bad for their relationship. Meet the Beatles, ah. Eric Clapton first met the Beatles when he was in the band The Yardbirds on a beautiful evening in 1964. They were the supporting act for the Beatles and they immediately have a connection that was so strong that straddled both their professional and personal lives. And on a day in 1967, George Harrison has a fight with the Beatles and he walks out on them, prompting John Lennon to ask Eric Clapton to replace him. But George Harrison eventually came back and changed his mind and Eric Clapton doesn't end up being in the band. But this doesn't stop Eric from becoming best friends with George Harrison. But I also think that this set up a competition within their friendship. And this is my intuition and my intuition alone. But I also think Eric Clapton was jealous of the Beatles. If you hear him tell it, he'll tell you that he didn't chase pop stardom. But if you look back at his early singles, he very much chased pop stardom. And the Beatles were able to have pop success with really interesting, artful, well-written songs. I really don't blame Eric for feeling jealous because I think he felt like he was the more talented musician. So he leaned into being a purist and a, a virtuoso guitar god. An ego can create an identity out of anything. So his identity became virtuoso guitar player and purist white blues musician. And you see that a lot in English musicians, them having an affinity for blues music. And that's how what Max started out in blues as well. And Eric Clapton played blues with Fleetwood Mac. I believe he resented Fleetwood Mac's later success as they became a pop supergroup in the 70s. Listen to this excerpt of Jenny Boyd's book. Eric was not impressed. I was aware of play at Wembley, their first ever gig back home with the new lineup. One night I went to the show with Patty and a rather drunk Eric. We stood at the back of the hall. Stevie looked magnetic, singing and dancing in her black chiffon outfit and high-heeled boots. The lights changed colour as they followed her across the stage, and when she grabbed the microphone and yelled out Rhiannon, I could feel the pulse of the audience rise. But Eric was not impressed. I was aware of him shuffling and mumbling beside me. He's a good guitarist, he said, nodding his head in the direction of Lindsay, but he's too tight too locked inside himself to be great. I think Eric was, in some ways, genuinely upset by what he saw. The Wembley show was worlds apart from the old Fleetwood Mac days with Peter Green. Eric had known Peter. They were like two musical peas from the same musical pod. Mick 
John and Chris had strayed a long way from the roots that sustained Eric. They had become an American supergroup with a snazzy, slick West Coast show, set, lights and all. After a couple more numbers, I could see Eric was getting increasingly impatient with Stevie, calling her a dark witch. Finally, he walked out of the hall and waited for Patty and me by the bar. I wasn't entirely sure if he really didn't like watching the band, or if he simply wanted a top-up. He sounds like a real bitter Betty, let's be honest. Now, I think Eric Clapton definitely had an attraction for Patty Boyd. That's no, that's without a doubt. But I also think it had to do with a sense of competition he had with George Harrison. I think there was ego involved, and I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> Beg and don't please, Layla. So Patty Boyd and George Harrison, like I said, they really started off supporting each other. But around 1970, they were starting to have some real problems. Like I said, he cheated on her and there was a lot of push-pull. You know, relationships have seasons. It's kind of like what was going on between Ariana and Tom Sandoval. Although, to be honest, that relationship was doomed. <laughs> At the time, Patty really wanted to make this work. So she searches for this home for them and finds this beautiful house in the English countryside. And it has gardens and has ivy climbing up the walls of the house, just like a fairy tale home. And in this home, they have decadent parties with lots of rock stars and famous models. And one of these people is Eric Clapton. And at first, there's this very innocent, flirtation between Eric Clapton and Patty Boyd. It was exciting to have this very talented man interested in what she had to say. And she feels flattered at the attention because things between her and George were not great. And she really liked Eric, but she kept him at a distance and she didn't think anything of it. Not until one day she receives a letter in the mail, a love letter signed by E. Guess who this is? If you guess Eric Clapton, I owe you a bandana. Well, I was trying to think of something 70s. But the love letter is one of the most passionate she's ever received. But she also thought it was kind of weird. She thought it was sent by a weirdo. A weirdo named Eric Clapton. And when Eric calls her later that day and asks her if she'd received the letter, she's like, that was you? What are you thinking? I am married to your friend. But she doesn't bother to tell George. She didn't want to cause trouble between them and she respected their friendship. But after this, Eric Clapton ends up getting with Patty's sister, Paula, who looks an awful lot like Patty. I mean, they are sisters. Funny how that happens. But Patty thinks, well, good, at least now they can, he'll get over this and they can just be friends. But it's also funny how Eric doesn't have the same respect for his friendship with George. Because one day he asks Patty to listen to a song three times. And that song was Layla. Layla. It's pretty obvious to Patty what this song's about, and she freaks out. And guess who else it's super obvious to? Her sister Paula. You know, the one who's actually dating Eric Clapton? So when the song comes out, Paula, who'd already begun to suspect that the only reason why Eric Clapton got with her is because he was in love with Patty, and he knew that Patty was unavailable which is a running thing with Eric. He only wants what he can't have because he could have stayed with Paula. They look almost identical. And I hear you say it could have been their personalities. I mean, it could be, but wait, there's more. So one day at a party, Patty and Eric are having this super intense conversation and George Harrison, who had been asleep, comes up to Patty and Eric talking. And out of the blue, Eric says, I'm in love with your wife. And George is silent, but he's pissed. And he looks at Patty and says, well, are you gonna go with him? She's like, no, dum-dum, I'm going home with you. Okay, she didn't say it like that. <laughs> but I would have. And she does go home with her husband. But this further drives a wedge in their marriage. Although honestly, it's totally hypocritical. 
because not too long before this, George Harrison had built a recording studio in the home that him and Patty shared. Patty, being the understanding rock wife, realized that recording sessions go well into the early hours. And one of Patty's friends was Ringo Starr's wife, Maureen. Well, one night, George asks Maureen to attend a recording session that went way into the early hours. And when Patty woke up, she's surprised to find Maureen is the only one still in attendance of said recording session. So Patty confronts Maureen and is like, what are you doing? And Maureen said, the better question is, what are you going to do about it? I mean, geez, that Maureen was a piece of work. So basically, being angry about Eric's confession was hypocritical of George Harrison. But now Eric Clapton has driven a wedge not only between her and her husband, but also her and her sister. And her sister Paula was so brokenhearted. Not only does her boyfriend want another woman, but he wants her sister, even though her sister didn't encourage him. So Paula goes down this horrible path that's talked about in both Jenny and Patty's book. And I don't believe in blaming other people's addictions on other people, but it's worth noting that this was the beginning of Paula becoming an alcoholic and an addict. But in terms of addiction, I do blame Eric Clapton for his own addiction. And in such a horrible way. Because one day Eric tells Patty, if you don't leave George Harrison, I'm going to take this whole bag of H. I'm going to be an H addict. And literally holding a bag of H in front of her. And hoping that he wouldn't actually do that, she says... I'm not going to leave my husband over this insane ultimatum. Well, after that, he holds himself up for three years and he becomes an H addict. I can't even believe how messed up that is. And Patty is racked with guilt for years. Marriage to George only gets worse. George, even though Eric tried to steal his wife, he feels really sorry for Eric and he really does admire Eric's talent. And Eric all but quits his career too. So they do a charity concert. I believe it was the first of its kind. But a lot of it was in order to get Eric Clapton working again. And at the concert, Patty sees Eric and proving that things haven't changed. He says to her, if you don't leave with me, I'm going to go further down the drain. And this was a different time. And there wasn't much education about addiction. And psychotherapy was not common for the every person. And now between her marriage being all but over, I, mean, I don't know. This has to be the most intoxicating thing ever. To inspire Layla, this incredibly passionate song from this unbelievably talented man who has such feelings for you that he's willing to throw it all away for you. Not to mention the guilt she must have felt. Even as messed up as it is, she goes with him. He gave to you a golden ring. And they do have some time of romance. He's a rock star living the rock star lifestyle. And they go off to these beautiful tropical islands and do what and go wherever they want. But it wasn't long before he started cheating on her. And after so much that went into getting her, because it was never really about her. More proof of that is that she's going through a divorce at the time with George Harrison. She didn't want to take any money from George, but he insists that she have $112,000. But being a Beatle, let's be honest, it could have been a lot worse for him. <laughs> and they had this really beautiful, cathartic conversation where they both make up, but George is going to remarry. And all of it was happening so fast. But the fact that she's upset by this marriage, this inspires the song Golden Rings. Let me read you the lyrics. He gave to you a golden ring. It made you happy. It made you sing. And I played for you on my guitar. It did not last. We did not go far. And though the times have changed, we are rearranged. 
will the ties that bind remain the same? So he'll cheat on her, but he gets all emo. When she's a little upset, George Harrison is going to remarry. The fact that this inspires more music, and this also tells me that it had more to do with his friendship slash competition with George Harrison. But I learned from Eric Clapton's book that Eric was an illegitimate child and that was a big deal back in the day. And his mother got pregnant really young. So his grandparents, in order to avoid scandal, they raised him and they told him his mother was his sister. And he remembers that there were lots of secrets in the house, lots of whispers. And one day at age 10, he realizes that the whispers are about him. And he finds out that his sister is actually his mother. So in Patty's book, she believes that this left him with a bitterness and a distrust of women for the rest of his life. And usually when you have someone behaving horribly like this, you find that it comes from somewhere. And you know, we know very little about Tom Sandoval and how he was raised. I wonder where his issues come from. And if she asks me, do I look alright? And I say yes. You look wonderful tonight. Do you like the song Beautiful Tonight? It is a beautiful song and it really il illustrates the highs and lows in their relationship. But I can't help thinking that the lyrics of this song are only about her looks and how it makes him look good. Compared to the song Something by the Beatles, I don't know. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. I'm curious what your opinion is. So if Beautiful Tonight is the high point, the low point has to be when Eric hooks up with Patty's sister, Jenny, asleep in the same house. I mean, just the ego of a rock star at that time to be that bold. I mean, at least it didn't happen because her sister said no, because her and her sister were close. And he admits to Patty that he did this to split them up as sisters, which is so messed up. And he says to her, I think I did it to split you guys up. Like that was supposed to be better or something. But many of her friends didn't say no to Eric. She befriended these two twin models. One of them, funnily enough, was named Jenny. Her and model Jenny, they got really close. Well, Patty comes home one day to find Eric Clapton on the couch having a conversation with model Jenny. Eric Clapton tells her to fuck off. Can't you see we're having an intimate conversation here? I don't know, go upstairs or something. And she was in shock. She did go upstairs and she cried her eyes out. And after she did, she packed up her stuff and left. And he tells her, yeah, I think we need some time apart. I mean, he was drunk, but still. <sighs> but she, of course, was still madly in love with him. Get on the ground, cocaine. <laughs> This song wasn't about Patty. It was inspired by Eric Clapton never really stopping the use of alcohol or drugs. It would go well into the 80s. I mean, the song Cocaine really says it all. One of the funnier stories in Jenny Boyd's book has Mick Fleetwood pulling Eric Clapton by the ear when he was being too drunk. And you know it's bad if a 1970s Mick Fleetwood says you're being too drunk. Honestly, hearing these stories about these legends, it really shows you how complicated people really are. Like Mick Fleetwood inspecting his wife's housekeeping, taking a white gloved finger and running it along a picture frame in order to see if it's dusty. All this makes him sound like a, a stern English nanny. But then there's the side of Mick that will take Jenny Boyd to a party after he's just told her about his affair with Stevie Nicks. Well, Stevie Nicks, she's also at this party, but Jenny Boyd doesn't see her because Stevie Nicks is hiding in a broom closet because she can't face Jenny knowing. I can't even imagine Stevie Nicks hiding in a broom closet. Patty Boyd also can't believe how complicated people are because while she's still pining after Eric Clapton, she receives a strange call 
from Eric Clapton's manager. And he's like, Eric wants to marry you, but he needs to know now. And she's like, this is so bizarre. The fuck? But she's been pining after him, so she accepts. What she doesn't know is that this is a cross between a bet and a publicity stunt. Because Eric Clapton, during a drunken card game, he bets his manager that his manager couldn't get his name in the paper. I guess someone was hard up for publicity. Well, this guy does, and he announces that Patty Boyd and Eric Clapton will be getting married. And this is so successful, it gets picked up by the Associated Press. So millions of people now know about this marriage, except for the bride. So that was the reason for the hasty phone call. And I don't think she knew for a long time, but she is happy because this is what she wanted and they do indeed get married. But it's a whole cyclical thing of just years of some happy times, but followed by years of drugging and cheating, followed by times of being sober. And during these times of being sober, they were trying to get pregnant. Patty desperately wanted a baby. She was the only Boyd sister to not have a child. And they would have a lot of issues. They tried a lot of different things. And IVF was less advanced back then. And she just accepted the cheating as part of the rock and roll lifestyle. But it gets worse for her, because one day, he comes home and tells her that one of these women got pregnant, Lori DeSanto, which would be hard for any woman on so many levels. She's already been trying so hard to get pregnant. There was a lot of back and forth even after this, and she actually accepted this relationship at one point, but they do finally split, and he marries Lori DeSanto, and they have a son, Connor. And I know there'll be no more tears in heaven. Being a father really saved Eric Clapton. He straightened up. He's a good father. He loves his son. He plays with him. I think this even causes him to rectify things with Patty. And Patty, she kind of has to start all over again, which was very hard for her because she didn't have a very good education. But he lets her have the cabin that they lived in together. I mean, it really is the least he could do for her. <laughs> and her seeing that being a father really changed him for the better. She really does like seeing him play with Connor. They remain friends, but it is bittersweet. It was March 20th, 1991, and Eric Clapton had taken his son Connor to the circus. They had a wonderful time, and they came back to his condo on the 49th floor. He leaves his son with his housekeeper. Unfortunately, his window, due to a, a loophole at the time, it had no safety latches and was left open. And it's so crazy that the window could be opened that far up. But his four and a half year old son, Connor, he fell out when his housekeeper wasn't looking. Just a horrible accident. And Eric Clapton had to put him to rest just two days before his own birthday. And his son saved him more than once and in more than one way because Eric Clapton had been drinking again. And this brought him back to rehab and he straightened himself out once and for all. And I think this tragedy really changed him for the better. And he wrote two of his most emotionally connected songs, uh, Circus and Tears from Heaven. I think Eric Clapton used to have problems with that. Some of his music isn't really connected in that way, and these songs really are. But I really think it all changed him into a better man. Although he did cheat on Sheryl Crow, so I guess old habits die hard. But at least he was her favorite mistake. <laughs> I don't know, we have to take the win where we can get him. <laughs> But I have heard he is a much better person. I think he made resolutions with Patty and they're still friends. Patty met her husband in 1990 and they actually didn't marry until 2015, but they're still together. So she had her happy ending. 
and she really deserves it. She really did for what he put her through. So if there's hope for a heel like Eric Clapton, there might just be hope for Tom Sandoval. One can hope. <laughs> but hopefully it won't take a tragedy like this one in order for that to happen. I mean, the truth is we are all here to learn lessons. And I truly believe that there's very few people on this earth that are beyond turning it all around, even today. I hope you enjoyed this little something different. Let me know if you liked it or just like it <laughs> and share the video. Sharon's Karen, y'all. <laughs> and here's another video, another interesting one. Uh, here's my music documentary playlist and you can subscribe right here if you feel so inclined. I hope the rest of your day is a wonderful, beautiful musical and bonsoir from the ashram.